Edith. Thank you very much for this. Oh, it is, it is somehow related. So, yeah, thank you very much for this introduction. And uh, as I understand, many of you are not exactly experts on cosmology and in particular inflationary cosmology. So, yeah, yes, yes, yes. So, I will try to be as pedagogical as I can. And if I would fail to do so, please not hesitate to. Yes, yes, exactly, exactly. So the first thing I, oh, something happened. That's a fantastic sign. Oh, it's working, it's working again. So the paper is written in collaboration with uh, Zygmunt Lalak, who is a professor at the University of Warsaw, and Marek Lewicki and Olga Czerwińska. And the paper is going to be published in Jacob in some weeks, hopefully. And let me start with the, with the picture that many of you could see, even though some of you may not work in, in cosmology. So this is the anisotropies of the cosmic microwave background. So when the universe was extremely hot, it was filled with uh, plasma, which wasn't transparent. So the free path of the electron, of the photon, was extremely short comparing to the size of the universe. So then the universe was t totally not transparent, but in relatively short period of time, all of the electrons were captured by cores of the atoms, the universe became transparent, and the first radiation that we can observe right now was emitted. And this radiation was emitted like billions of years ago with temperature of order of 2,000 of Kelvin, but nowadays due to the expansion of the universe, this is a microwave radiation, and this is the so-called cosmic microwave background. It surrounds us from, it pretty much comes to us from all possible directions, and there's a homogeneous bath of this, of this radiation in the whole universe. So first of all, people measured this radiation and discovered it is extremely isotropic. So that was the first surprise, kind of. So this measurement pretty much told us that the very early universe, the universe of the so-called last scattering era, around 300,000 years after the, let's say, Big Bang, was enormously, enormously homogeneous, which is quite a surprising thing to discover. And the second thing, which is interesting, is that this cosmic microwave background has tiny inhomogeneities. So the red points show you the places where it's a little bit hotter, and the blue ones show you the directions where it's a little bit colder. And the interesting thing to note is that all of the large-scale structure of the universe that we have right now, galaxies, clusters of galaxies, and so on, it comes from those very tiny inhomogeneities that we can, that we can observe. And how tiny they are? It's like 10 to the power of minus 5, the contrast between the fluctuation of temperature divided by temperature. So it's really, really very tiny fluctuations that gave birth to all of the structure of the universe that we have right now. So there are two questions to ask right now from here. So first of all, why the early universe was so enormously homogeneous and isotropic? And the second question to ask is why there were such a small inhomogeneities and why they had features that we observe right now? So, and there's much more questions to ask in here. Nowadays, we observe, as, as we observe the universe, we could create the so-called cosmic cake. You could say, okay, so all of the circle is 100% of the energy density of the universe, and you can ask yourself how much of this energy density of the universe is baryonic matter that we know, like planets, tables, physicists, stars, and so on. So it's only 5%. And then around 25% is dark matter, which are kind of heavy particles, or maybe super light, we don't know, some kind of particles that do not interact with. Oh, but the gravity, dark matter as gravity was excluded by a bunch of experiments some time ago. But it could be just a field without... Oh yeah, sure, 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 without a particle, yeah, oscillating scalar field, for instance, yeah, sure, 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 Def definitely. Yeah, but there is a kind of matter, as far as we believe, not really a modification of gravity, and then there is dark energy, which behaves pretty much like cosmological constant, which doesn't redshift while the universe grows. And this could be modification of gravity, this could be an extra field, this could be maybe massive gravity, this could be extra dimensions, whatever we can imagine. So pretty much all we know is the 5% of the energy density of the universe, and there is 95% of the so-called dark, dark sector. Okay, so now I would like to, in my talk, I would like to combine those two things. I would like to ask ourselves whether we could find the answers to the first two questions we ask about the homogeneity of the universe and whether we could put all of that in the framework of the dark universe, of this dark sector that we know it exists over there. So how to answer those 
questions regarding the cosmic microwave background. So there is a most popular answer, not the only one, but the most popular is the so-called cosmic inflation. And the cosmic inflation is a very brief period of the evolution of the very early universe, when the universe was not only growing, but accelerating. And how to get such an effect? It's actually pretty straightforward. So let's say that we have many, many causally disconnected regions in the early universe. We call them horizons. So in at least some of these horizons, the universe is quite homogeneous and isotropic, more or less. Yeah, you have billions to choose from. So let's say that it's relatively safe to say that some of these are quite homogeneous and isotropic. So inside, uh, so do I have a pointer or anything like it? Oh, no, wait a second. Oh, there is one? Uh, here? Oh. Okay, so then you can say that in homogeneous isotropic universe you can, you can uh, describe your metric tensor as a, simplify your metric tensor into friedman orbison walker metric. And here we assume it's a flat friedman orbison walker but it doesn't really matter that much whether it's flat or not. Okay, so we have this homo more or less homogeneous part of the very early universe and now you can ask yourself what is the matter which fills the universe? So now we will assume that it's a scalar field. It's not such a crazy assumption, isn't it? We know that fundamental scalar fields exist. We have a Higgs field. And then so many theories of physics beyond standard model tells us that there should be tons of scalar fields, like supersymmetry, supergravity, string theory, extra dimensions, lots of lots of scalar degrees of freedom to expect. So not surprisingly, we can say that there is some part of the universe which is more or less dominated by a scalar field. And since the universe, this part of the universe is more or less homogeneous, then we can say that the scalar field is only time dependent, that it's pretty much homogeneous as well. Okay, so then the scalar field has a potential term, it has some kinetic term, and then you can ask yourself how the scale factor evolves. So you write the Einstein equations for this metric tensor and for this matter, and they simplify into so called Friedman equations. So here you have Hubble parameter, which tells you how quickly the scale factor grows and it grows as quickly as the energy density of the universe. And here you have a time derivative of the, of the Hubble parameter, which is pretty much the kinetic term. So the interesting thing to note is that if you assume that the kinetic term is much smaller than the potential term, then h dot is much smaller than h square. So if time derivative is so small, then you can approximate, you can more or less say that your Hubble parameter is constant. And if your Hubble parameter is constant, then from this equation, you see that the scale factor grows exponentially. So this is a very good example of accelerated expansion of the early universe. And the only thing we have to assume is that the kinetic term is much smaller than the potential term. It's not such a crazy assumption for chaotic initial conditions. I mean, you st again, we have billions of horizons in the early universe, at least. Absolutely, absolutely. So there is another, uh, 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 yeah, there's another, let's say, point of view. You could say that your homogeneous path is a little bit bigger than you initially assume. That maybe it's not one horizon, but more. And then even assuming that initially the kinetic term dominates, you reach domination of potential term anyway. You have the so-called attractor solution for inflation. But one could say this is finely tuned because your assumption about the initial homogeneity of the universe need to be stronger. So it's, yeah, so there are many issues regarding the initial conditions for inflation, but maybe let's, yeah, let's not go into, into details. All I want you to remember is that we, that we pretty much need scalar field and big potential, not that huge kinetic term, yeah? And how to have big potential term and, and, and how to have small kinetic term? Well, before I go to the next, next slide, let me just show you here pretty much your potential needs to be flat, yeah? If your potential is flat, let's say that your field is rolling on your potential. If your potential is flat, then the kinetic term will be quite naturally small, yeah? So you want to mimic the cosmological constant with your potential. There are two ways of doing that. So one way is that your field rolls on the plateau. And this is the so-called small field inflation because the field doesn't change its value that much. And the other idea is that the field rolls down on the potential which is not limited from above by any physical scale. And in both cases, field reaches a minimum of the potential which ends inflation. Here the potential is sufficiently flat. Here the potential is sufficiently flat. Here it's not. Here it's not. Inflation ends. 
So pretty much what, what we need is at least part of the potential, which is flat enough in order to support accelerated expansion. Okay, so which models are supported by the data, you can ask yourself. Definitely these kinds of models. So you can, here you have a plot which shows you the const experimental constraints. And this guy is, tells you how, much, how many of the gravitational waves you have produced during the cosmic inflation. And this guy tells you how much scale independent your inhomogeneities are. So during inflation, you produce tiny inhomogeneities of your scalar field, and therefore you produce tiny inhomogeneities of the metric tensor and so on. So you can create all of those inhomogeneities of the cosmic microwave background that later on we observe. And you can ask yourself, okay, I can decompose my inhomogeneities into different wavelengths. And if I do so, how much the amplitude of those inhomogeneities depend on the wavelength, how much they are scale dependent. So if this guy is one, exactly one, they are not scale dependent at all. There's full scale independence. So the experimental constraints tells us that we are pretty much very close to scale independence of inhomogeneities, which says it doesn't matter if you produce wavelengths like this or like this, their amplitude should be pretty much the same. Okay, so the constraints tell us that the small field inflation is very much preferred. So these models in here, they pretty much are the models with inflationary plateau, with a flat part of the potential, and these guys over here, which are excluded on many sigma level, these are more or less models of this kind. Still, we have hundreds of models that fit the data, and it's a massive problem for inflationary cosmology. Okay, so why the inflation is not enough? So after you finish the period of inflationary expansion, your universe is extremely sad, cold, and empty place. Why? Because let's say that you had some other degrees of freedom during inflation, yeah? What happens with those? We already said that the energy density of the inflaton should be more or less constant during inflation. But what happens with the energy density, let's say, of dust? So this redshift, like scale factor to the power of minus three, which more or less should redshift like this due to the exponential growth of the scale factor. So if you had some dust initially, it's massively suppressed by the, by the era of if cosmic inflation. So let's say we had some radiation then. It's even worse. Radiation redshifts like scale factor to the power of minus four. So this was even more suppressed during cosmic inflation. So pretty much at the end of inflation, all you have is your inflaton, no dust, no radiation, very empty universe, nothing to create stars and planets from. So what you need is the reheating of the universe. What you need is some mechanism which would dissipate energy density from inflaton to normal matter that can create us. And this is called cosmic reheating. So you increase the temperature of the universe, you create lots of relativistic degrees of freedom. And this is usually done by the assumption that there are some direct couplings between the inflaton and the normal matter. And via these couplings, you produce many particles. And there's, there are two problems about this picture. So first problem is that if those couplings are quite strong, then they create radiative corrections, loop corrections to the inflationary potential. And the potential may not be as flat as it used to be. So pretty much maybe inflation is impossible if your reheating is too efficient. And the second problem is that we don't really know when reheating happened. So uh, if we when we talk about inflation, you can say the highest scale for this is a gut scale, which is like 10 to 16 GeV to the power of four. And the lowest scale of inflation is more or less like what? Dozens of MeV. So there, there are 70 orders of magnitude difference between those scales. Lots of freedom to choose from. And the same t goes about reheating. Pretty much reheating of the universe could happen around the gut scale, could happen just moments before Big Bang nuclear synthesis. And we have no experimental constraints when it actually happened, which causes massive confusion. 
Why? Because it's nice for you to know when exactly physical scales that are yeah, physical scales that are generating your in primordial inhomogeneities of the universe, when they were exactly created, at which moment of the evolution of the universe. You need that to constrain the models with respect to the data. Yeah. Higgs is actually a very good example because Higgs it may be a very successful in flatton field. And uh, the very, let's say, strong coupling, direct coupling of Higgs to matter somehow solves the problem of reheating because it always generates us lots of. Oh, it is. So the observations, I would say that the constraints are so, are so weak. Yeah, 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 sure, 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 sure. So I would say that the constraints are so weak that the many, many things are matching the... Uh, but Higgs field is a perfect candidate for inflaton, and there are many models that are trying to, try to use it, try to use it as an inflaton field. Okay, so what's the problem? So here we have the number of efaults before the end of inflation. What is the efault? The efault is how many, let's say, how many powers of natural number e, your universe have grown. So pretty much you can say that <coughs> number of efaults is your time variable. After a time equal to one efault, your scale factor grew e times. Yeah? So 10 efaults means that your scale factor grew e to 10 times during this time. So you can ask yourself how many efaults before the end of inflation a very particular physical scales were produced. Physical scales that we can later on refer to while making observations, while making experiments. The problem is that since we have no idea when exactly inflation happened, when exactly your heating happened, and we have the 70 orders of magnitude of freedom in here, then this num there's, there are huge uncertainties on this number, which is the issue, which is a problem for us. So I will try to fight with this, and I will try to provide a decent mechanism of reheating Assuming that the inflaton field is a part of a dark sector, assuming that dark matter and dark energy can be related to, to the inflaton. Okay, if the inflaton field is a dark particle, it means that it has no direct couplings to any of us. Yeah? So this means that pretty much normal matter from which we are built cannot be produced via direct coupling between the inflaton. Uh, so, no, in, uh, in my talk, it can't be Higgs for sure. It, it can be Higgs for sure, yeah. So if there are no direct couplings, what is the only coupling which is left to be? It's gravity, which is always there. Everything interacts gravitationally. So we will try to see whether it's possible to reheat the universe only using gravity. And this is, the, the whole trick is called gravitational particle production. It comes from the, uh, is from the quantum field theory in curved space-time. And it's rather, the whole procedure is rather long and technical. So I will do my best to skip it as much as I possible, just to give you the intuition about the, the physics be, uh, behind that. So let's say you are analyzing the evolution of the universe using the conformal time. And the conformal time is defined like this. So here is your physical time in the metric tensor, and here is the definition of a conformal time. So using that guy, you can say, okay, during my inflationary era, I have more or less the sitter expansion. So my scale factor should more or less behave like this. After inflation, universe comes into deceleration phase. So I don't know exactly how, it's, how it evolves, but it's some kind of decelerating universe. And this is pretty much evolution of quite general decelerating universe, where W is the barotropic parameter. So this guy tells you how, what is the relation between the pressure of the matter and energy density. So for dust, it's zero. For radiation, it's one third. For cosmological constant, it's minus one, and so on. So we have accelerated the Sitter universe, decelerated universe, and we have some smooth transition between those. So let's say that the smooth transition is short and rapid. And you can ask yourself how gravitational background is changing during this rather short period of time. It is 
somehow change. You can, if you quantize fields in curved space-time, you see that the gravitational background contributes to the effective potential of the field. So by changing radically, dynamically, uh, the gravitational background, <coughs> you somehow move the effective vacuum of the fields a little bit. So if you move the effective vacuum, you cause the excitations, and you produce particles. So pretty much during this interface, your field sits on the bottom of its potential, and you move your potential a little bit due to the fact that the Ricci scalar changes, and you excite the field, you produce particles, just by changing the, the background of the, the evolution of the background. Yeah, ex so it's like a Bogolubov coefficients, maybe this is the, the, uh, the, the <coughs> so you can calculate the energy density of radiation. So this was actually discussed by Ford in 1986, and there is a very nice paper by Yokoyama from 2012 where they, where they discuss it as well. And I don't want to go into details again in here, but the only thing I would like to tell you is that you can actually produce some radiation over there, assuming this period was rather short. So let's say it was short, and let's say you produce some radiation at the end of inflation. How much of the radiation you produce? Big N is the number of scalar degrees of freedom that you have in your RD universe that you can produce. And the important thing to note is that... What do you mean by degrees of freedom? Yeah, infinite yeah, yeah, so a scalar field, let's say, scalar fields, yes. <coughs> yes, a number of scalar fields, I would say, and the, <coughs> the minimal the minimal number is one, no, because there's Higgs. The of of yeah, sure, 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 sure. Yeah, sure. So number of scalar fields, and then minimal number is one, let's say, because we have Higgs field for sure, but for sure we can have much more. So in the supersymmetric theories, this would be like 100, more or less. Yeah, with the it's already quite impressive. So one could say that your fields have non-minimal coupling to gravity. If they have, then this coefficient appears. So psi, let's say that you have field phi, yeah? And if your field has direct coupling to the Ricci scalar, then you have such a coefficient. If psi is equal to zero, then your fields interact with gravity minimally. And here you have your barotropic coefficient at the end of inflation. So this guy tells you, what is the relation of the pressure and energy density of the inflaton after inflation? And this is the scale of inflation. This is the Hubble parameter at the moment of inflation. And this is scale factor to the power of number four, minus four. So always radiation redshifts like scale factor to the power of minus four, pretty much every single time. So this coefficient just tells you how energy density of radiation dilutes why the, that why the universe grows. And what's wrong with this picture? Well, we, you have some radiation, but you have tiny, tiny bit of it. So your energy density is proportional to the Hubble parameter to the power of four. But the Hubble parameter is much smaller than Planck mass. So this guy is much, much smaller than this guy. And this is pretty much an energy density of the inflaton at the end of inflation. So what you end up with is inflaton field, which dominates the universe completely at the end of inflation, and tiny bit of rahitic, which is subdominant. And we know that at, the, at least at BBN, radiation was already dominating the universe. So how to solve this problem? How to find ourselves in a realistic universe? Well, you need your inflaton field. Let's say that this is the energy density of the inflaton field and this is the energy density of radiation. You need your inflaton field to redshift very quickly to lose energy density very quickly with time, while the universe grows, much faster than, than uh, radiation. And this can be done. This can be done. So first of all, this can be done if inflaton is the oscillating scalar field. And it's rather easy to imagine that there are so many potentials that give you inflation, which at the end of the day ends up with such a potential. So let's say you have a field which oscillates around potential of this form, so then your barotropic parameter, again, the uh, relation between pressure and energy density is given by this formula. And what do you mean by oscillating? Where is the time dependence? <coughs> so, let's say you have your potential. Let me just erase it a little bit, I guess. It is actually, so, so the cosmic friction can be completely neglected in here. And this mathematical solutions are rather easy. So what you have 
is some kind of with some kind of potential. And you have a field which oscillates, yeah? And what you say is we take the average over one oscillation. Yeah? You take an average over one oscillation. And then you try to think what is the pressure divided by energy density. Yeah, so this is kinetic term minus potential term. Kinetic term plus potential term. And actually, if you assume that this potential is proportional to phi to the power of 2n, then there is some simple analysis which shows What do you mean zero dimensions? Zero no. dimensions, I mean there are no space dimensions. No, they are, they are, absolutely. Where are the space dimensions? No, 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 so the field is homogeneous, first of all, yeah? So field, <laughs> no, 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 but this is, no, 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 no. I mean, I, there's no dependence on the, on the, on the space dimension. So no, which is, which is natural thing to expect, because you had cosmic inflation, and inflation homogenized the whole universe. So there is no reason to expect that the field will have strong dependence on dimensions. We, it's... Yeah, the fluctuations are the another story. So this is the evolution of the background. Of course, the fluctuations are being produced. So the background is zero-dimensional? Yeah, yeah, in this sense. In this sense, it doesn't depend on the, on the space. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's not static. It's dynamical, but it's, it's, it's uniform. Yeah. So in order to have this picture, in order to have your inflaton field, which redshifts so much faster than radiation, you need, this is you need n, which would be... So, but then you ask yourself whether the models are realistic. You ask yourself whether the... Are whether it can be... Well, maybe let's leave the... This is rather philosophical, I would say, issue. Let's leave this philosophical issue to the later part of the, of the talk. So, assuming this potential is uh, phi to the power of 2n, if your n is bigger than 2, so phi to 6, phi to 8, and so on and so forth, then your inflaton field redshifts much faster than radiation, and you can finally get the radiation domination of the universe. And then there's another idea. So, we already said that the inflaton field is usually, inflation is usually realized by the domination of potential term. But there are actually many models where the kinetic term dominates of the, the potential term. So if your kinetic term, let's say this is a, a standard kinetic term, yeah? If your Lagrangian contains some crazy powers of kinetic term, then you can actually get a De Sitter expansion, and later on, inflation ends, and you end up with massless scalar field domination, which pretty much corresponds to Bartopic parameter equal to one. And again, this is a, a good example of a model which can give you scalar field, which initially dominates the universe, but redshift so quickly that radiation can dominate the universe later on. Okay, so do we have any constraints on how much of the inflaton is, can be left today? Let's see. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So let's say that we were looking for the earliest constraints on the early universe. Yeah, how, what we can say about the very early universe? The first thing we can you can you can ask for is the the first thing you can ask for is the Big Bang nucleosynthesis. So it's hard for me to hear myself. Uh, okay, so the Big Bang nucleosynthesis is a era around the MEV scale, and this is more or less the time when we have our earliest constraints on the evolution of the universe. So what we can say is we have strong constraints on the energy density of the universe at that time, but not perfect constraints. We still have some uncertainty which comes from the fact that there is some difference between measured and theoretically predicted number of effective neutrinos. So pretty much this guy tells you what is the uncertainty on true Hubble parameter at BBN and the Hubble parameter assuming there is only radiation in the universe. So at the end of the day, if this would be one, then you would be sure that the universe was dominated only by radiation. But this small number in here tells you that at the BBN's era, there could be some additional field. And, okay, let's say that there was some tiny, tiny bit of extra matter of BBN, which contributed a tiny fraction of percent of the total energy density. 
of the universe. But let's say that this extra field was redshifting very quickly. Yeah? So if you go back in time, if you go back in time, your tiny, tiny contribution starts to dominate the whole universe. So here we plot Hubble parameter divided by Hubble parameter for radiation only. And you can see that, for instance, for the massless scalar field case, if you go back to, let's say, 10 to, yeah, 10 to 2 TeV, 10 to 3 TeV, your Hubble parameter can be a million times bigger than it would be in the standard thermal history of the universe. And we have no constraints on that at all. We have no idea what was the actual value of Hubble parameter around TeV scale even. That's an interesting issue. So the question is, what would be the source of such a matter that would dominate the universe in early time? It could be dark inflation, yeah? So the leftovers of the inflaton which dominate the universe could run the evolution of the universe through all of the cosmological era. And very shortly before the BBN, radiation could, could start dominating and we would have no experimental constraints, no experimental data to tell us otherwise. So maybe, maybe, the whole history of the universe, as we imagine it, is a lie. And we can ask ourselves whether there are any experimental tools to, to measure that. OK, so since we already know that at the moment of nuclear synthesis, the radiation needs to dominate the universe, then <coughs> we can constrain the energy density of yeah, the scale of the inflation in our dark inflationary model. So you know how much of radiation you have produced. You know when radiation needs to start dominating. This is the energy density of radiation at the moment when inflaton is exactly, energy density of the inflaton is exactly equal to energy density of radiation. So you take this guy and you can say, OK, at the moment of BBN, I know that this cannot be bigger than this. Yeah, need to be smaller equal than this and it gives you constraints on the scale of inflation. So why the scale of inflation cannot be too low? If your scale of inflation is too low, you produce tiny, tiny bit of radiation. And your tiny bit of radiation will never manage to dominate the universe before BBN. So already, as assuming the reheating was purely gravitational, it gives you the lower bound on the scale of inflation. And here we put many constraints on the scale of inflation, which comes from different things. So first of all, you can assume, yeah, so first of all, you, you say that your scale of inflation cannot be bigger than the one gave us by the gravitational wave data. So what we have in the early universe is the primordial gravitational waves generated by inflation. And we don't observe them, and we have only constraints on their, on their amplitude. And those constraints, the one-to-one -one tells us what could be the maximal energy density of the universe during inflation. So it gives us the upper bound for the energy density of the universe, which actually is also upper bound for the Hubble parameter. So this line comes from the data from the... The blue line comes from the data from the gravitational waves. OK, the lower bound comes from the fact that you want your universe to be radiation dominated during the BBN. And the upper bound comes from another effect. So you produce your tiny bit of gravitational waves during, during um, inflation. But the question is, what happens with these guys later on, after inflation? So the energy density of gravitational waves redshifts like a to the power of minus 4, right? no, like normal radiation. And let's say your background after inflation redshifts like a to the power of minus 6. Yeah? Let's say the universe is dominated by massless scalar field, which is quite a realistic case in the context of the dark inflation. So the contrast between those two guys would, would grow like scale factor to the power of two. So, your, so initially, your gravitational waves could be a tiny, tiny contribution to the total energy density of the universe, but this contribution would grow in time it would be a bigger, bigger piece of the cosmic ca cake. And we have strong constraints on this guy at BBN. So this a to the minus 4 does not depend on the cosmological constant? No, this is just a feature of the waves. So yeah, but yes, but this is for massless waves. If ah, so... so, uh, 
so you say that, uh, for instance, for modified gravity, for modified gravity, uh, no, for the it's lambda? Massive. Yeah, yeah, sure, 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 sure. So, so one of the interpretations yes, yes, this is, this is a very good point. So, uh, first of all, you can always ask yourself what is the mass scale of the massive gravity? And it should be, in order to fit to the data nowadays, it should be order of magnitude of the Hubble parameter nowadays, because you want the gravity to be very weak on the edges of the universe. So this scale will be so small through all of these scales, through all of this evolution of the universe, that the mass of the graviton could be negligible. But nevertheless, there's actually an interesting counterexample of a mass of a graviton which is time dependent. And it's actually, this actually could be interesting to see. But if this scale evolves, if the scale of the massive gravity evolves with time, maybe it could drag the evolution of the gravitational waves along, along itself. But for most of the cases, massive gravity wouldn't really have a massive influence on, on this guy. But this includes cosmological constant. No, no, because cosmological constant may have many, many other origins. May, it may be a scalar field, it may be a... Mm. I would say the other way around. If you have massive gravity, then you have cosmological constant. Well, but but uh, it works one way only. It works one way only. You have many, many models with massless uh, gravitational modes. And, and effectively, effectively cosmological... No, no, they are. So for instance, what you can do is you can take an F of R theory. Yeah, and you can say that you have an F of so, but we are uh, deviating from the subject. I would also, uh, this is a fascinating discussion. Let's continue that later on. So maybe the, my conclusion is, my conclusion is that the space here, the space which fits to the data and uh, the space which is al allowed by all of those constraints, actually vast majority of inflationary models are here. So dark inflation puts some constraints, but those constraints are not too strong and it can be realized by so many models. Okay, what is the, one of the strongest points of dark inflation, of assuming that the reheating was purely gravitational? Well, I hope you remember this guy. Where, oh, where was it? I hope you remember this guy. This was a number of efaults before the end of inflation when one particular physical scale we observe was generated. And I told you, since we have no idea about these numbers pretty much, then uh, we have huge uncertainty of this guy. So. Let's say you assume that the reheating was purely gravitational and everything massively simplifies with this one assumption. So this complicated equation simplified into that one, where, again, this is a number of scalar degrees of, free, uh, of, of scalar fields in the early universe times this non-minimal coupling to gravity. This is the barotropic parameter, this guy. After, after inflation, yeah? And this number is pretty much close to one always. <coughs> yeah, since it's logarithmical, this can vary from one third to one in our case. This can be maybe a hundred if it's a supersymmetric theory. This can be a very small number if your nominal coupling to gravity is very close to the conformal factor. But anyway, there is no 70 degrees of freedom 70 degrees, of, sorry, sorry, 70 orders of magnitude of freedom uh, in this coefficient. So actually, your uncertainty of n star is, is so small. And here we plot like a few examples of it. So actually, you can see it's always around 65, plus minus 1, which is amazingly tight constraint. Because usually we say, well, it could be 70, it could be 50. So it's like usually the freedom in there is, is huge. Okay, so we have generated our gravitational waves during inflation. Okay, let's say that we have some of it. And they have a very interesting feature, namely their spectrum is flat. So there's almost no scale dependence when you discuss the so-called primordial gravitational waves. Uh, so I within some, within a range, within a range of scales, of course, within some range of scales. But what's what's interesting, what, what's what's interesting in regard of these primordial gravitational waves is that they are, that their amplitude is modified by two eras, two cosmic eras. So first of all, your gravitational waves may evolve in dust domination, dust dominated universe. Yeah. So if they don't evolve in dust dominated universe, then energy density of the universe 
red shifts like a to the power of minus 3. And this guy decreases like a scale factor. And this is pretty much this era in here. What can happen to them is they can evolve in radiation domination. Oh, so that, that dark matter, for instance, dark matter, yeah? So this is a, like a physical field which dominates the universe. And let's say you have radiation. So radiation redshifts exactly like gravitational waves. So this guy should be constant, yeah? So this is this part of a spectrum. And this part, which is maybe the most interesting one, is when, let's say, your matter field is redshifting very quickly, like for the gravitational reheating, and this guy grows like scale, scale factor to the power of two. So this is a mechanism, assuming that there was a period of the evolution of the universe when the thermal history of the universe was massively non-canonical, when some fastly redshifting fields were dominating the universe, one can actually enhance primordial gravitational waves massively. Here you can see that, unfortunately, for the numbers we have chosen, for the one scalar field in the universe, minimally coupled to gravity, it's very, very hard to be observed by any experiment in the future. Tiny thing, tiny bit of BBO, but actually it's very, very hard. But what happens if you assume that it was less than one, effectively, scalar field? So this is actually hard to imagine, but let's say, what is and effective. And effective is number of scalar fields, one minus what six psi, where psi is the non-real coupling to gravity. If psi is equal to one divided by six, this is a conformal factor, and then no particles are being produced. So what you can assume is that your psi is quite close to the conformal factor, quite close to, to one divided by six. And then this number can become much smaller than one. And what happens? Well, then you can actually totally measure the primordial gravitational waves in the future experiments. And if you would observe such a signal, this would be such an amazing thing. First of all, it would be a powerful tool to test the thermal history of the universe. Now we have no idea what happened before BBN. We observe such a thing. Wow, there was an like massively non-canonical evolution earlier on. The other interesting thing is that it would somehow test the modified gravity. How can you observe this if it comes from all directions and has no time to I, frankly saying, I am Homogeneous. very far from being an expert on primordial gravitational waves okay. in the context of their measurement. Okay, uh, sorry? Oh, so they are anisotropies. Sure, 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 but sure. If they come from all directions and if there is no characteristic... No, no, there is, there is. So, so, so primordial gravitational waves, by definition, are in homogeneities at the homogeneous background. So they are part of all of this in homo primordial inhomogeneities generated during inflation. So by definition, they are, so these are, just fluctuations? They are, they are yeah. So they are tiny fluctuations, and that makes it super hard to measure. And we just hope with the future, future experiments. So you know, this is the guy that we have right now, and all of these guys, they are far future of the, the universe. So, so, so maybe in next decades, we will be able to see such a signal. But still, it's a fascinating thing. So first of all, you would test the thermal history of the universe. Second of all, you would test whether the mass matter was non-minimally coupled to gravity. We would test deviations from, from Einstein's gravity. And the third idea is that we would test dark inflation at the end of the day using this. So this would be a very, very powerful signal, signal if we would measure such a thing. Okay, so another possible application of gravitational reheating and dark, dark uh, inflation. So in order to get inflation, you need some potential. Let's say we have a scalar potential with some flat plateau, at least locally flat plateau. Yeah? This is a perfect example of inflationary potential. Your field rolls down very slowly. It pretty much looks like cosmological constant in here, generates the Sitter expansion. Here, inflation ends you produce some particles gravitationally. So you produce tiny bit of radiation at this point. Here, your scalar field, which still dominates the universe, universe, rolls down really quickly. It rolls down so quickly that it effectively behaves like massless scalar field. And it's 
barotropic parameter is equal to 1. So it redshifts super quickly. So then you wait, 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 and your tiny bit of radiation produced in here starts to dominate the universe. But what happens with the field? The field rolls over there, and at some point starts rolling back, and rolls again on the plateau. So it mimics cosmological constants once more. So it could be a good candidate for dark energy. So in such an approach, you can say you can have inflation dark energy using only one scalar degree of freedom, only, only one scalar field. This is for me quite exciting because it massively limits the amount of new physics needed in order to explain the observational universe. And there are a bunch of models how to, how to do such a thing. Okay, so another interesting issue. Another interesting issue related to the dark inflation is the electric phase transition. So we know that the electric phase transition happened around 100 GeV, yeah? so quite a long time ago. And we know that in standard model, it's a second order phase transition, doesn't produce any gravitational waves, but if you introduce some modifications to standard model, then it's a first order phase transition, it gives you the CP violation, it gives you all of those things we need for particle physics, but it also gives you some primordial gravitational waves. And why? Because when you have a first order phase transition, and let me just... Am I running out of time? Is it... Oh, 10 minutes, so, so more than enough. Yeah, so if it's, let's say you have a Higgs potential, yeah? This is a Higgs potential for the zero temperature. And this is the Higgs potential for the symmetry restoration case for some very high temperature. Okay, so initially your Higgs field sits in the here, which is a global minimum of this potential. Assuming you have first order phase transition, when your temperature drops, your potential develops second minimum. And then the minimum in which the Higgs was sitting initially becomes a false vacuum. And you have some finite probability of quantum tunneling of your field to a true vacuum. And if this happens, then in the whole universe, in the ocean of a false vacuum, you have some bubbles of true vacuum. Those bubbles tend to grow, and those bubbles tend to collide with each other. And the collisions of those vacuums create gravitational waves that we can maybe observe in the future. Again, it's a question of next decades. Now we have strong constraints on those things. We can't, uh, we can't say we see anything, but we expect this kind of signal to, to appear in the next 20 years. How optimistic, huh? So uh, why, is it, why is it anyhow related to this gravitational reheating and dark inflation? Because while calculating how many bubbles you would create, what you take into account always is Hubble parameter, because you want to know how quickly the universe expands. The potential changes as the temperature drops. If your universe expands much faster than you initially thought it would, then your temperature drops much faster, and you have much less time for tunneling. So at the end, you produce much less bubbles, and there are much less collisions and less gravitational waves. But, but then you if the temperature drops, you have a higher probability to go over the vacuum, not tunneling, by just paying attention. No, 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 it's not the temperature that drops. Uh, so, so, no, you, you, so yeah, temperature drops quickly, but it doesn't, it's not higher anyhow. The temperature of the transition is always the same. It's always 10 to 2 GV. The Hubble parameter may be much bigger. Yeah, yeah. So no, what happens is so. Let's say that you have some temperature T1 in here, and temperature T2 in here. Yeah. How much time? How much time you need to go from T1 to T2? Yeah. But the drop of a temperature of a of a of a course of a transition. So 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 you. you have a yeah. yeah. <laughs> but at least about that. 
There's a two time scale. So <laughs> one is the quench, that is what you are talking about, going from T1 to T2, and the other is a normal going over the barrier, you know, under the barrier, but over the barrier. So thermal fluctuation that would yes. kick out, kick and out the. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it, in order it's to not make a. Zero yeah, yeah. No, of course, it's not a zero it's temperature. Not zero yeah, 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 yeah. So, zero temperature so we took. Well, yeah. So we took that into account. The, the, so, uh, so these are the instantons, the Hawking instant, the Hawking instantons. No, how they are called? How, the, how these instantons are called? The, that. So I'm not an ex I'm very far from being an expert on quantum tunneling. My friend, who, with whom I wrote the paper about it, uh, took into account this quantum, uh, this thermal fluctuation that, that can kick out the field. Because if it's deeper, then the probability that you are going over the doesn't have to be deeper at all. So the the yeah, potential. Yeah. Goes down. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Potential when it's deeper. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Mm. Sure. So the thing is that if you go through the anyway, through the barrier, okay. yeah. No, no, no. It's much more too complicated to me. Never. Okay. So the question is whether if you go like this through the barrier via thermal fluctuations, whether you still create bubbles like this, yeah? Of course you do. You do. So if I yeah, yeah, yeah. you do it locally only. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sure, 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 sure. Yeah, 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 absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, so what I can tell you, so I'm very far from being an expert. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, sure, 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 sure. So this is not the Higgs potential. Oh, let's say it is, let's say it is, yeah. Yeah, so, well, it's rather hard for me to draw in 3D on the blackboard. Uh, you do, you... Yeah, 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 yeah. There's no for the standard model. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Sure, sure, sure. So, but as I said initially, in order to let's say have CP violation, in order to have many nice features of the that standard model don't have, you usually introduce some modification to standard model. And these modifications may come from, for instance, extra dimensions. They may come from phi to the six term. They may come from uh, couplings to supersymmetric particles. Oh, so I, I guess that I guess that everybody wants to commit a harakiri. So I look on the faces of people and they want to kill themselves. I guess we could. So. <laughs> so whatever you call it, I mean, there's no that, that's after the symmetry break. Yeah, yeah. so the, the symmetry. symmetry. Break. So it's uh, uh, so my so idea is that maybe we could talk about it in a second because I guess that everybody wants to. Yeah, everybody wants to kill themselves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So it's always model dependent. You have to modify the standard model some way, and depending on the modification, you get a signal. You get the first order phase transition in some way. So it's always depending on the way, the way you modify standard model. Okay. So maybe going to the conclusions, what I wanted to say in here is that on one hand side you produce much less bubbles, much less gravitational waves. On the other hand, on the other hand, you still have an effect of this guy growing like a square. So at the end of the day, your signal may be stronger. The peak of the signal can be shifted. And if in a few decades we will measure gravitational waves from phase transitions, again, this could be a powerful tool to tell what was the thermal history of the universe, whether gravity was modified, whether there were extra dimensions, whether there was dark inflation with gravitational reheating, and so on. So again, this would be a... Yeah, 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 sure, sure, sure. I never said that was for sure. Yeah, that's the whole point, to see it in the future. So to summarize, because I guess we have so many things to discuss, Inflation is usually considered to be needed in the universe, but it leaves the universe very cold, sad, and empty place, and you, you need some reheating, some mechanism of reheating the universe, and the reheating via gravity is rather inefficient, but still possible, still working, still okay with constraints, and all you need is some oscillating scalar field or some inflation driven by kinetic terms, and it can all be fine, and dark, Inflation, dark reheating, gives us very strong constraints on n star, on the number of efaults before the end of inflation when particular physical scale is produced. And then 
gravitational waves can be massively enhanced and measured in the future if the fields in the early universe are non-mutually coupled to gravity with and rather close to the conformal factor. Thank you very much. Okay, I have a question. Uh, so, so the idea of reheating by gravity is that the time-dependent gravitational background field excites yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, modes of, of uh, quantum fields. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but why does it happen primarily in the transition period? Because you've got something going on also before and after. Uh, what is the exact reason why this happens mostly during the transition period? Ah, so yeah, yeah. So if you if you if you see, take a look on the effective potential yeah, that you have. Your effective potential, actually, let's say your your equation of motion. So let's say this is your scalar field, yeah, that you want to investigate in the early universe. So you say, let's consider the scalar field as a function of x and as a function of the conformal time. And actually, let's consider scalar field rescaled by the scale factor to even simplify the equations of motion. And, and so let's call it kind of var phi, yeah. And what you end up with at the end of the day is this kind of equation. Uh, not to make a stupid mistake. Okay, so this is the, let's say, wave mode, yeah? And this is your Ricci scalar, and this is your second derivative of potential. So what's Interesting here is you can ask yourself which term <coughs> changes quickly. Which term changes quickly? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is in Fourier space. So let's say you ought to ask yourself which but term changes quickly. When did one term change? You cannot do it in Fourier space. No, no, we are not. So this is, these are tiny fluctuations of the background. So we can keep it linear because our reheating is so inefficient. There's no back reaction. There's no back reaction. So you can ask yourself which terms, which of these guys actually changes. Dramatically, yeah? So this guy, not that much, especially not during inflation, because the potential is so flat. But this guy, however, when you mo change the inf end inflation, this guy is the biggest, gives you the biggest contribution. So actually, it's, uh, you, are w you want to wait for a moment when the effective potential would change dramatically, because your field <coughs> is in the bottom of the, of it's in the vacuum. You move the potential, and your field starts to, to oscillate. Yeah, so you want a change, and the biggest change comes from from this kind of Obama stuff, you know. Yeah, it comes from this guy. And in the paper of Ford from 1986, it's explained in like massive details. It's really fun to read. Any other questions? If no, that's uh, thank you.